course, I know that that's not the end of my story. I love practicing medicine, but what happened was I found my superpower is listening to people. Listening in those spaces where they feel unheard and putting it into words for them to help them. And then we can get to the root of the stress problem and get to the next step for you. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's just my honor and pleasure to be with you here on another brand new episode. I am so excited. Have you ever been introduced to someone and you're just thanking the person who introduced you like, wow, you really you really hit the nail on the head with that introduction. <laughs> and that's what I love about this show. You guys keep sending in guest ideas, whether for yourself being a guest or you know someone that you either read their book or you, they're a friend of yours, whatever, and you send in, you should interview them. Well, a friend of mine who's been in my world for probably 15, 20 years introduced me to Michelle Johnson. She is an amazing woman. And she's also the author of a wonderful, what I call quick read, which is really, to me, that's the highest praise because it's easy to read. And that doesn't mean it's simple stuff in there. It's good stuff. You can read it without struggling (laughs) too much. And and it was a quick read for me. and I loved it. It's called Pain-Free, How to Live a Full Life Despite Chronic Pain. And I loved the book. It had so many great ideas. I love books that just gives you workable things, workable solutions right away. So Michelle and I had a chat, oh, I don't know, a month or so ago, just fell in love and decided let's do a show. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be a part of your space. So thank you so much for having me here. Oh, it was, uh, we had such a great chat. You and I should have recorded that, too, because that was an awesome chat when we got to know each other. But anyway, we're here now. We're going to talk about this idea of pain-free, but it's not just pain-free. I want to go back, Michelle, to why this book, because you have just a very fascinating history uh, that I'll say I've seen histories like this before and going, hmm, that makes a lot of sense why why this book so just tell us a little bit about your history well, of course so i am one of only children of my mom and dad together and growing up on the west side of chicago i had a lot of love in my family but we did not have a lot of money so what i'll say is i had a lot of difficult lessons about poverty about violence And by the time I reached about 23 years old, though I was a great student and had been a dancer with my church, I had a lot of trauma built up in my body. And what started to happen is I started to experience chronic pain where, you know, hey, sometimes in the morning, my legs wouldn't work going Mm. to the bathroom or very scary. Or you would fall asleep on the road, you know, in between stop signs. One time I woke up in the middle of an intersection. Oh, wow. (laughs) I think one of the things that I could relate to in your book and our meeting last time was for me, as you talk about in the book that you were diagnosed with chronic fatigue, as well as fibromyalgia and other things, is this combination of trauma and stress really seemed to be a precursor to a lot of autoimmune conditions. And I know that you took your history and turned it into what I'll call an amazing life because you went back to school and learned all about this and became a physician's assistant, right? Yes, yes. 
So, I mean, the path is never straight ahead, right? You go through your dips <laughs> and your valleys and so many things that make you onto the next step. And you mentioned, hey, you know, you have fibromyalgia and something happened to change. And what happened was I was denied disability. We had talked about when we first got to know each other, how so many of us with chronic illness take on that identity. Mm, mm -hmm. And a lot of the groups that were supposed to be supportive were very, very depressing. And I remember just feeling like, okay, well, I have to get on disability to help myself because I think I can't make any money. I'm falling asleep at work. I can't hold a job. And getting denied disability was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I think a lot of people are going, what, Michelle? How could that be? But your amazing success story, and I'll say despite, as you use that word in the title, despite chronic pain, I just, as I was reading your book, cheering you on, so to speak. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Your can-do spirit. And when you wrote that in the book, I was like, wow, that just takes real guts and real courage to uh, be able to transform your life. But one of the things I want to comment on about, as you were talking about groups, it's interesting the distinction that was made between those groups where it was a pity party versus groups and people in your life that you found were supportive and uplifting and cheering you on. Oh my goodness. And that's, that's how life works, right? There's going to be people telling you not to go after your dream, people telling you what you can't do, people kind of poo-pooing on your happy day. Okay. <laughs> and then you'll have people who are like, I see that maybe her car is broken down and she's out of gas, but I see her out there pushing the car. Let me help her. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people around me, and you were mentioning in my book, I just feel like it's a fairy tale sometimes that just because I was trying, someone said, oh, let me help her over and over and over again. And help you in interesting ways. There were a number of people that you write about did direct help, like very obvious help, and others more like just keeping you enthused or keeping you going instead of a direct input on your help. I'm thinking about my own healing and how we need both of those kinds of people in our lives. Maybe the sideline cheerleaders as well as the team. <laughs> you know? mm, absolutely. I mentioned that my mom played a pivotal role after I was denied disability. It wasn't that she came to my home and, and baked things or made things. My mom's words stuck with me. What she had told me was that, baby, remember, you can always pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and start all over again. And she had been telling me that since I was a child. And so when it came to this, this situation where, you know, hey, I'm not able to work, things are going bad, I'm on disability, they, I've tried disability, they denied me, this is what everyone tells me to do. And her words were, you can always start over. There's always a way to brush yourself off and get up again. And so when you talk about that indirect help, it's not always somebody coming to do. It may be some, a sentence that changes the trajectory of your life. Yes. I remember we were sharing stories about this idea, and I'm circling back to this idea of the diagnosis as someone's identity. And I mentioned to you a speech I was giving where I was talking about body language was what we were talking about, but understanding the difference between behavior and going inward into this concentric circle of is someone making this their identity. And all too often mm -hmm. I see people make the diagnosis their identity. And I give you a big bravo that you've kept it out there into the medical situation. I'll say symptoms and behaviors not in the identity circle. And that's so different when someone says, I have, and they're saying it with a very conviction of ownership, that, and they give you this long word, and you're like, wow, that's their identity, versus uh, 
I always tell the story of someone could say I have cockroaches, but that doesn't mean I want to keep them, right? Right. <laughs> I don't have ownership of that. <laughs> not not mine. Do not belong to me. Thank you very much. And that's what I uh, I love about you. You've put your diagnosis out there like, okay, we'll agree that's here, but that doesn't belong to me. <laughs> that That's going to not define who I am. And I think that's the critical point because back at, I think you, in your book, you said you were in your early 30s when you went back to school? Yes. So after my son turned one years old, I was 31-ish and I went back to school. What had happened, I was working in an eye clinic and as an ophthalmic technician and the doctors that I worked for were incredible. But the patients that I worked with would say things like, you should go back to school. (laughs) You should, you should okay. be the doctor. Can I, can I see you as my doctor? And one of the doctors I work with said, you know, Michelle, I will pay you to find something to do working from home so you can go back to school. And when he said that, it was like, well, maybe I should go back to school. Maybe there's something more I need to be trying. And I won't say that it was necessarily that medicine was the end all be all, because I know that that's not the end of my story. I love practicing medicine, but what happened was I found my superpower is listening to people, listening in those spaces where they feel unheard and putting it into words for them to help them. And so even with being a clinician and going back to school and getting accepted to do going to China and Cuba and learning all these holistic medical things, the end point has been My superpower is listening. And so now as a life coach, that's what I help people with is I listen. And then we can get to the root of the stress problem and get to the next step for you. And so that really has been pivotal for me. Like you said, being able to start over that resilience, that not taking it on as ownership has all been a product of listening to the next. I love that idea of listening to the next and the idea of about this idea of the next because sometimes people think it's got to be this huge thing like the next and I say it could be an hour from now the next depending on where you are right now in in a flare or whatever's going on in your world it may be the next five minutes or less is the next right it doesn't have to be 10 years down the road it's great to have those things to aim for But I think sometimes people get too bogged down in this idea of too big of next that they don't know what to do next. Ain't that the truth? (laughs) Ain't that the truth? (laughs) But I love the idea that we are like an orchestra, right? You have the flutes, you have the harpsichord, you have the winds and strings. And so maybe I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I have this illness that I have to contend with. I have this role in my life. And we, as we play the different parts in the orchestra, they all have their part to play. And sometimes something's a little off key and we have to pay attention and tune that part up. So same thing with this, right? We have our roles as parents, maybe as an entrepreneur, and like so many different things are vying for our attention. And you say, I don't know what's next. Well, what is off tune in your hearing? What is letting you know it needs some attention in your orchestra? Mm. You make the most beautiful metaphors both here today and also in your book about this idea of being part of the being the conductor of your orchestra. That's absolutely lovely. And is so true that you don't have to fix it all at once. (laughs) And one of the you mentioned your superpower was listening. And I I think one of the brilliant things is oftentimes I find this best healing comes from someone else who's been on the road. They've been Mm. on the path and they can listen for those same opportunities that maybe they wish someone had heard them during Mm. that particular time of their healing. Or maybe 
it's they're nodding in agreement. Oh, yeah, I've been there, I've heard that before. <laughs> you know, I had a clinician one time that I went to see, and it was not related specifically to the autoimmune, but it was fascinating to me as she was asking me questions on the first, how are you? Let's get to know each other event. We were chatting. And I finally stopped and said, can I ask you a personal question? And she said, yes. I said, you know, the questions you're asking are quite unique. Either you or someone you know very close has autoimmune, correct? And she said, I do. Mm. You could tell from the quality of the question. Yes. They had some sort of experience with what people with autoimmune conditions go through. And I think that's what makes your superpower so strong is... She, you know what to listen for. What a great story. That is so true. And like when I'm in the exam room with someone, I can tell when they're a clinician. I can tell when they have some medical knowledge about their illness. Like you, you're right. There's so many things that you, you lean into their, their hearing. You lean into their, their speech. And I agree. My perspective as a patient has really informed my life as a clinician. It's made a difference. Yeah, I think it's so important. <laughs> although, although on the side note, let's just put a little asterisk on there. We're not wishing anybody have to be that. No, but it but it is a superpower when when we are already there. It is a superpower that we can can use as that ability to, to understand because with autoimmune. The term I understand, I don't really, it's not a favorite term of mine, that this, this invisible illness, invisible disease, invisible condition, however you want to call it, but the word invisible is always there. Goodness, if you listen exquisitely, you observe exquisitely, it's not invisible. It's not invisible, but it's just that too often we're in too big a hurry to pay attention to all of those little things that let us know someone else is in pain. So let's talk a little bit about chronic pain. I know with your condition, we've talked about fibromyalgia on the show and chronic fatigue on the show before, but let's just tell people who aren't familiar with it a little bit about it. And then we'll go into some of the key things that you offer in your book, Pain-Free. Absolutely. So fibromyalgia, as we understand, is a neuromuscular illness where the areas in between the muscle fibers get excited as if they should be receiving a pain signal. So you know what pain does. Pain lets us know, take your hand away from the stove. It's hot. That will continue to burn through your hand if you don't move it. So pain is a warning signal. It is an, uh, a signal to our body that it's time to repair something. And so what happens in fibromyalgia is those signals are out of whack and the body and the muscle fibers in between the muscles are just kind of going off with this signal and saying, we're in pain, we're in pain, even if the stimulus should not be painful, okay? Um, over 3 billion people in the U.S. have uh, uh, fibromyalgia, okay? And I think that's a, an astonishing number for how little is put, I won't say, it's, I think it's becoming more and more uh, observed and researched, but for how long it took to get people to, uh, the people and the powers that make these decisions to acknowledge that this even existed beyond being a mental illness. Well, um, back in the day when I was diagnosed, I've been diagnosed for 20 years now. Um, it was still in the office of rheumatology and when they found out it is not really truly an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. from their criteria, they kind of kicked it out of rheumatology and back into the primary care realm. And what I learned during those times is there was a lot of confusion because if you can't do a lab test and find something or you can't have a visible thing that you mentioned um, to hang their hat on, there was this idea of it must be psychological. I went to eight doctors before receiving the diagnosis. Um, even now, as a medical provider, when people see that on my chart, there is a difference in the way they approach me and I have to be an incredible advocate because some doctors still think this is a mental illness. And that you were doctor shopping. 
as they yeah. say. Yeah. I, I've had a long list of doctors I've gone to, and for a variety of reasons, I always say this, you might disagree because you're in the medical profession, but it's okay to say, hmm, this relationship isn't working. I'm going to go somewhere else where I feel heard. It's, I Absolutely. always say, it's okay. It's okay to fire your doctor and don't be embarrassed if the doctor fires you. It's okay. Absolutely. All people are not meant to gel and connect. And that is a very special relationship. And so when we talk about doctor shopping, yeah, that is like a poo-poo name, like, oh my goodness, they're looking for different drugs. But no, you can be relationship shopping. You can be dating a situation and not have to be married to the situation. <laughs> you can exactly. be right, you can be figuring it out. And so I tell I'm an advocate for that as well. Find yourself a holistic minded provider who you can comfortably communicate with. That's it. Right. Safety and trust and permission are my three criteria. Do I feel safe with this person? Do I trust this person? And do I have permission to speak my mind, no matter how crazy a question it might be? That's necessary. And, you know, you, you talk about like that kind of disagreeing by being in the medical field. I think there are a lot of medical providers who have remembered their humanness um, and who know what it's like to be on the other end of the medical system, but our system is so broken. You know, um, a lot of providers are held up by what insurance will let them do. Mm -hmm. um, we're held up by time frames. I mean, I remember being booked uh, three patients in 15 minutes. I read that in your book and I was absolutely astonished. I mean, because you think about, hello, by the time you're past the niceties, there's a, at least a minute of that five gone. Absolutely. And so it's not easy. And that's why I, I always say self-care is the new health care. Because learning how to take care of ourselves, learning how, how we eat, of course, what we put in our bodies mentally and physically, how we manage our stress, because stress is 77% of the reason why people come to the doctor. Stress-related and stress-exacerbated illness wow. is huge. Wow. We need to take a quick commercial break. You guys think about that number, 77%. That's, uh, you know, over three quarters. So when we come back from this commercial break, we'll talk to Michelle about how she works with people with stress. That's one of her specialties is helping people through stress and anxiety. So we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters. 
a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're here with Michelle Johnson, and she is a physician's assistant and has written a wonderful book called Pain-Free, How to Live a Full Life Despite Chronic Pain. She's a fibromyalgia thriver, as I like to say. Never been a fan of the word survivor. So she is a fibromyalgia plus <laughs> gold star thriver here. And we've been talking about her work and her understanding of fibromyalgia, but I want to get into some of the tips and techniques she offers in the book. And she works a lot with people on stress and understanding how stress can, um, you know, if you let it get out of control, it can really make whatever your diagnosis is a lot worse. So let's talk about it. I know in your book, one of your first tips is create your ideal environment. And I think a lot of people limit their thinking in that of like, well, you know, I've got other members in my household or whatever. But let's talk about how you expand people to talk about creating their ideal environment. Oh, absolutely. So our environment, uh, not only our physical environment, our mental environment is important for us to be intentional about. And as you know, Sharon, I do a lot of human design and talking with people about self-knowledge. One of the types, like your type, uh, needs to be in an environment that's conducive. If you're not, everything is bad. So for many of us, if there's clutter, if there is uh, mind clutter, if there's stuff all over the place. Nobody has to be a neat freak, but if you know that that makes you feel a certain amount of stress, getting yourself into a system where that is not a part of it will change your trajectory with your stress relationship. Your environment, like um, if you have problems with mobility, having rugs and cords and stuff in your environment is kind of setting yourself up for a fall. We do this with our elderly folks, with our um, friends and family to make sure that they don't fall. But if you have an illness or a, you have to remember that there are limitations on you. So making it easy for you and your environment is something easy to set up and start from the beginning on the right foot. And then your mental environment, what you put in your space. Are we watching the news 24 seven? Are we, um, watching Ratchet TV all the time, things that are putting things in our mind to put us in the negative space. Just like I mentioned the groups, scrolling through those things online about people saying depressing story after depressing story after depressing story had an impact on me and that was my mental environment. So what you have surrounding you is so important. You become part of your environment. So you need that to be conducive and feel good for you. Oh, I think that's so important. And you talk about getting your family on board with some of the environment. <laughs> and you are so lucky you have such a supporting fa supportive family to, <laughs> to do that. Oh, my goodness. My fellas are life. My fellas are everything. My husband and my son um, have gone on this crazy adventure with me. And yeah, I try to get them to do stuff. But look, I tried to go vegan. Those fellows were like, no, thank you. Uh, bring the meat. Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> and so we have, we have to act as an orchestra in our family too, right? What needs the attention, the wind, the, the, the strain. And so I managed with, hey, I'm going to try this and help them with their journey wherever they are. So I, I agree that sometimes we have to pull those levers in the family situation. Honey. Yeah, and I love this. And help them wherever they are. I think that's also what makes you a great physician's assistant is that idea of, look, you meet them where they are. And I have a friend in the communication world who talks about when we're communicating with people, and it could be at work or at home or even medical, you, know, you meet them where they are and you help them find where they want to go. <laughs> and I just think, Absolutely. I love that idea. You just, it's not about 
well, what's wrong with them? Get them over here. It's like meet them where they are and help them find where they want to go. Oh, that's awesome. And that is so key. That is so key. That's coaching. We take you from where you are to where you want to be. So often what will happen is people will use that term like they're a coach and they think about that football coach who's yelling at you, do this, do that, you know, give me 20. And so they have this idea that someone's going to beat up on you and make you do something to get to the goal. But it never works that way, especially like patient and client relationships. You have to buy in to what you're doing or else it will never work. So if you have a physician or a healthcare provider telling you, you got to lose 10 pounds, you got to lose 10 pounds. No one's telling you, talking to you about a strategy that will work in your life and the things that you have to do about how to lose that 10 pounds. Are you going to lose that 10 pounds? Well, especially if they need to lose 20. No. <laughs> you know? I don't know if you've ever had that happen, but some healthcare providers lecturing you on something and you're like, oh, dude, <laughs> you could, you want to join me? <laughs> Can you just hear my life? Can you just hear what's going on and help me know how to do that can be a big one. So like you said, t- meeting them where they are and helping them find out where they want to go. I love that. I love that. I love that. You know, the other one that I find interesting, though, is how few medical professionals, I think it's becoming more and more popular now, but really understand the key critical factors that nutrition plays. You were talking about becoming a vegan and family members are, you know, slowly adapting. That's okay. How few are willing to say how big nutrition plays in our healing and our pain. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of nutrition and pain when we come back from this quick commercial break, because I think that's often overlooked because before my diagnosis, I'd eat a salad and I thought I was eating healthy. So, (laughs) which isn't a bad thing, but it's all the stuff you put on it. So we'll be right back. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm here with Michelle Johnson, and she is the author of Pain-Free, How to Live a Full Life Despite Chronic Pain. She's a physician's assistant, and her main areas of expertise are in autoimmune, as well as exquisite listener that she is, We're, is also in understanding stress and that what stress and trauma and anxiety do to the, the healing process. So one of the things that I know adds stress to our life that a lot of people don't think of it as stress, but is poor nutrition. It really stresses the old cells out, doesn't it? Absolutely. Nutrition is huge. And I, I talk about how we had one week of nutrition education in school. 
nutrition is a science all on its own. And even like in my process of helping people heal, I bring in a functional nutritionist because I don't profess to know all the healthy things to eat. There's always like these evolving thoughts on, hey, put this in your diet, put that in your diet, and this is the best way. And so it is a science. But what I found is remember 80% of weight gain, uh, diabetes control, cholesterol control is our food. 15 to 20% is our exercise and movement. With our food, our food, our food, remember food is medicine, food is nourishment. Food is not entertainment. Food is not our escape. Food is not our comfort. So two thirds of us stress eat. One third of us don't eat at all when we're stressed. Mm. Well, I was thinking about the what the pandemic fifteen or whatever they call that. <laughs> Man, the pandemic forty. People have been getting like it's it's a big deal because during that kind of level of stress we're all walking around in right now, none of us have ever dealt with anything like this before. Like I said, 77% of folks who come to the doctor was because of stress and stress-related illness. That was before the pandemic. Wow. So, right. That was a 2016 study. I would hate to know what it is right now then. Uh, right. Yeah. Even if they're not admitting so the level what, of stress that it's bringing, right. it's sort of this collective energy that's this heaviness that's out there, that you're walking down an aisle uh, somewhere or, it's, or down the street, and the person crosses the street, and you're like, I was already 40 feet from you, you know, or whatever. I, it's yeah. a weird and anxiety-producing thing when your neighbor will wave from, you know, 60 feet away, but not want to chat with you anymore. It's, it's a weird thing. It's a very weird thing. And like I said, none of us knows what's what. There's a lot of uncertainty. The majority of calls I get in my telemedicine practice right now is I think I have COVID. I'm anxious about COVID or I can't sleep because somebody has COVID. Like, and so when I talk about that stress and anxiety, guys, this is not just that it makes flares of autoimmune disease worse. It's like, you know how the Grand Canyon was built with water right? Mm -hmm. Just streaming through. And eventually it eroded away at the earth, a trickle of water. What stress does is it erodes our organs, our synapses and processes, our immune system. Our gut is the biggest concentration of immune cells. So think about what stress does to that second brain there in our gut. So having issues like continuous IBS or um, irritable bowel syndrome disease, eventually turning into ulcers, eventually turning into stomach cancers. It's a wearing away. We get so fluid with, oh, I was just stressed out or, you know, that's good stress. But remember the Grand Canyon, that we don't know how long the trickle takes. We don't know how far it's going in this particular direction. Is it going at my gut? Is it going at my heart? Is it going at my thyroid and hormones? Because remember, sugar is escalated, cholesterol is escalated. All these things are markers of chronic stress. And I love to tell the people the story of like the Dutch winter hunger that in Nazi Germany, when you know they decided that they were not going to feed the Dutch because they were betrayed. Those women who were pregnant, who starved during that time, those babies grew up and even though the war was over, even though they had a life that was back to normal, right? They still had the imprint of those stressors. They were still more likely to have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, regardless of what they did in their life. So it's carried on our DNA. It's a huge deal. And so I just, I didn't want to be remiss in that stress connection and the nutrition connection, because what we put in, just like our physical environment and what we put into our mind, Garbage in, garbage out. So what we put into our bodies, that nutrition factor is a part of what stresses our body, what new nourishes our body, and what path we tend to go down. I'm glad you bring that up and, the, I, and uh, that you work with someone who's a professional nutritionist because 
with autoimmune, there are so many factors. You could be gluten sensitive. Not You don't have to be celiac to have a problem with gluten, guys. You can just be gluten sensitive. Or it could be chemicals in your environment. It could be, you know, there's all sorts of things you can be sensitive to. For one thing, I found out in a Absolutely. sensitivity test that I'm sensitive to parsley. Now, who would have guessed? <laughs> I, ha right. I have a friend sensitive to pumpkin. Who would have guessed? I mean, she said to me, Oh my goodness. She says, I eat pumpkin like once a year, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it explains so much to her why she felt sick and lethargic after Thanksgiving. And she always thought it was her family. And I, I, I jokingly said, Well, it could be both. <laughs> but... <laughs> right. Combinations and complexities. But yeah, that's a huge deal. With my recent illness, I had an illness where I lost 45 pounds over the course of five months. And no one could explain this to me. And I remember just thinking that, you know, hey, I may be dying and no one can tell me what's wrong. And part of the problem was when I would eat certain things, I would just vomit them up. I couldn't hold certain foods. Mm. And, you know, even though your eating was termed healthy, like the leafy greens, Brussels sprouts, you know, I was trying to eat all these things. And what would happen is I found out later, fibrous vegetables upset my digestive tract. And so the broccolis, the Brussels sprouts, the things that I was trying to eat were actually affecting me negatively, but I, I didn't know. And so when your gut gets affected negatively, it kind of shuts down. It'll start not absorbing nutrients. You'll start lacking um, B12 and being anemic and all that stuff. And that's what was happening. And it's so surprising because I think if you went to a number of medical professionals and they say, so what are you eating? And you said Brussels sprouts, broccoli on the list. They're like, well, can't be your diet. That seems all healthy, which it is. We're not bashing Brussels sprouts and broccoli here, guys. <laughs> Just for Michelle, <laughs> at that moment in time, it wasn't the right thing, right? <laughs> right. And things change. Things are dynamic in our body. Our water intake is a huge deal, you know. So learning these things about your own body, self-knowledge and self-care, like I said, is the new health care. Because you get the billion-dollar workup. And unfortunately, you know, there's things we're taught to look for and there's things we're taught will kill us. And so we, we have to make sure those things aren't happening. But what if that's not the thing? What if it's just that your body isn't vibing with the nutrition that you're getting? Which it seems counterintuitive in a way. I don't think a lot of people would first look at that. Well, I am eating healthy. And then finding out that, well, the way your microbiome is right now, the way the, uh, the rest of your body is functioning right now, that particular stuff is not the right thing. And in your book, we're down to about 13 minutes. So I want to chat about this because in your book, at the, at the la one of the last chapters, you talk about keeping records of this, keeping in a, a details of some of the things that are going on in your life. I, uh, to me, it was sort of like my term for medical journaling, because uh, how important that what is to have a memory of it, because I know when I always thought when I started with the autoimmune uh, healing journey, oh, <laughs> this is so huge. I'm going to remember it. Yeah, well, not, I, I don't remember a lot of the finer points at this point. <laughs> Especially as you heal. Um, as you heal, you may not remember the valleys mm -hmm. of, you know, feeling helpless, feeling like, you know, you can't do. And then that you overcame that. Right. You know, so often remembering that, I overcame that. I have overcome hard stuff. Well, and to me, not only overcome hard stuff, but if I've done it and I've overcome the hard stuff, it, sometimes for me, as I first started down this journey, it was so easy to like, oh, I could cheat just this one time. And then that became two times. And then it kind of became a habit. And I had to go back and reflect on, okay, <laughs> what was it that I was doing that had such good success? And then I started cheating. But that's, I mean, that's so much part of the healing journey, right? We'll heal over a part and it may develop a scab and then something bumps up against it and that scab kind of peels back a little bit and we have to do some repair work. That's, that's healing. That's what it is. We're not going to always get it right. It's going to be messy sometimes. But like my mom said, you know, you brush yourself off, you pick yourself up and you start over with the new knowledge that you gain from that fall. 
I love that. What are some of the things that you suggest people keep track of in their healing journey? Definitely how we're eating. The way that our foods affect us is a huge deal um, because the gut, mind, and body connection is a lot bigger than what we as medical professionals thought for a long time, okay? So noticing, you know, what your diet does to you. And when I say diet, what you're putting in, your food, your drink, your activity. One of the things for me that I had noticed that was a big deal, I stopped watching the news. I had to for my mental health. I think a lot of people joined you on that. Right. Um, seeing the George Floyd, seeing that it's like how, how many traumatic events can you continue to put in here and think that it's going to be okay and think that, you know, you can go forward. So that's a big deal for me. Um, some other tips, making sure that you know you because you're, you're uniquely and wonderfully made. And so to think that everything that works for everybody is going to work for you, you have to try things out. You have to try on coats, take coats off, and you have to see what things work for you that are uniquely great for you. And so that what that means is you have a toolbox. Sometimes you need a wrench. Sometimes you need a hammer. Sometimes you need a screwdriver, right? And so same thing with our body, sometimes we're going to need that meditation tool. Sometimes we're going to need that deep sleep um, guided meditation. Sometimes we're going to need to exercise differently because, hey, my leg's not working. So I may need to not do um, kickboxing today. I need to do yoga. Okay. And so we need to be adaptable and listening to our bodies. Not so much our minds. I feel like so often we're talking about our positive thinking and don't get me wrong. There are so many healing benefits to positive thinking, but what we can get trapped into thinking is that science and, and thinking, the categorization and evaluation and judgment of things is going to fix something and your mind can't move a pencil. Your body has to do that. So you have to get into your body and listening to that conversation that it's having with your mind. And so, like I said, different tools for different jobs. When you explore these different tools, I know for me, I do a lot of different meditation. I do African drum healing meditations. I do um, sky breathing, which is an advanced form of breathing. So you have to find those things that get you out of the negativity, that gets you out of feeling in the funk. So after you journaled and found out what makes me feel what way, not just with our nutrition, but what things we're putting into our mind, then you can act from that data by sampling these dis different experimental tools coming from a place of self-knowledge. When you're chronicling things for your medical journey, um, things like my blood pressures, my weights, like an orchestra, you're paying attention to the things that don't sound right that are out of tune. If you're tired all the time, what's going in? What's coming out? What's our blood pressure? What's our, when we get a headache, what do we eat that day? What time of day did it come? So journaling for yourself, because you're the best medical record. I want us to get out of the habit as a people of thinking that we're going to go somewhere and someone's going to give us a pill to fix us. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. It's never meant to be that way. Now, medicine is a form of healing. It's designed to be something to help you as your body repairs. Your body is brilliant. Your, your body is rejuvenative. And so learning how to do self-care is the new health care. For sure. Absolutely. And understanding that. I love that you said getting out of this idea that going somewhere, taking a pill, this idea of take two aspirin and you'll be fine in the morning isn't how it works. The body does beautiful repair work when given the right environment and the right amount of time. Oftentimes we cannot, if we have spent a lifetime breaking it down, we can't rebuild it. In, in 24 hours. Baby, baby, come on. I've been eating good for a week. Come on. <laughs> That's not going to change your microbiome. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We were talking with Dr. Sandra Barrett one time. She, she's a cell expert and she was describing how the cells re mm. will repair themselves and they will replace themselves in the right environment but that it takes time for everything to turn over. You have to allow Come and on. giving yourself that space and grace and setting good boundaries to me is important. When, as I was going through the healing journey, I think everybody in my world's fairly well trained now, and I'm using that word trained in air quotes, but fairly well trained now, this idea of boundaries being 
they would say things like, oh, it's, you know, so, so and so's birthday, just one little piece of cake's not going to hurt. But I knew for me, the minute I started down that road, I like cake. <laughs> I was afraid those yes. little cells inside me start screaming like that, uh, what, <laughs> that big old plant and that mo weird movie, you know, feed me, feed me. So... <laughs> Little shop of horror. Yeah, there you go. That's the one where by setting good boundaries and telling family members or friends, you're like, no, please, please respect that I can't and I won't eat that because it's not going to help my healing. And I don't want to get started on having to undo that again. Mm, good for you. Good for you on the boundaries. Yes, I don't think setting boundaries is all that easy. But the thing that is easy is a clock sets boundaries. We're down to this the last minutes, Michelle, I want everybody to know what final thoughts do you have on this that I haven't thought to ask as well as where can we find your book and all about your exquisite coaching? Uh, thank you so much for having me. For the viewers listening and, and audience, I would really say, when you listen to things like this, when you hear conversations about people's stories. Sometimes it can get really easy to think, well, that's out there or that's what they did. And I'm here to tell you that what one does all can do, that it is possible for you to live a life that is unique and awesome and everything that you design it to be. That the steps that we are talking about in this healing journey are possible for you. And so as you listen through and you take your notes and you say, well, this is something that I can pay attention to in my orchestra. I want you to remember that just take one step at a time. You can always get up. You can always brush yourself off. You can always start over and that you have companions and Sharon and I who have done this ahead of you and, and says that the path is good. In order to find me, my book is on Amazon. It's called Pain Free, How to Live a Full Life Despite Chronic Pain. I am on both Instagram and Facebook as the Pain Free PA. Um, I do corporate and individual coaching. And so I love to talk about all things that are healing and stress strategy solutions. So thank you so much for having me, Sharon. And thank you, beautiful people, for listening. And I hope that you got some insight out of today. Oh, Michelle, awesome, for sure. I love your story and how you've turned your life around. Bravo. And now share the wisdom that you've gained for all of us to follow the path that's already been blazed by you and, and so many others. And continued healing to you and yours, everyone. Have a great week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Oh, and Michelle, before we go, I, I don't think you mentioned your website. What's your website? My website is www.thepainfreepa.biz. Dot biz. Okay, everyone, we'll have that up at understandingautoimmune.com, as well as on our Understanding Autoimmune Facebook and other social medias. And join us over there as well. Drop us a note and let us know the things you learned from Michelle's story. And that's what it's all about is sharing stories of thrivers and success strategies. So as I said, join me next week for another brand new episode. Have a great week, whatever your adventures. And adventures is the key word there. Keep smiling, keep laughing, and keep living. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.